Uh, oh shit, I almost went. I mean, hello everyone and welcome to Shonen Archive. I'm Loki. I totally remember to hit the record button, I swear. I'm here with Zenron. Hello. And we're here to talk about... Oh, well, first of all, this is a show in which me and Zen have dedicated ourselves to watching all Shonen Jump anime that is available to us. Certain stuff that just isn't translated and stuff like that. That would be funny to just watch it with no subtitles and take a stab in the dark to see what <laughs> what is this show actually about. Like kind of like how you watched uh, Houseu back in the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we plan to do that until the actual end of the universe itself, or until one of us gets taken out by whichever thing may end up taking us out. I personally think. I get hit by a truck at some point, but we'll see what ends up taking us out. If you have any, <laughs> well, who knows what the future holds for us? But we know for our current God PR, only knows. God only knows. But our current plans here is to talk about Gintama episodes. I believe it is seventy six through eighty one of the Yagyu arc. It's the next big arc of the series. We made sure to situate it so that we got the entirety of it in one go, so we'll be able to talk about it. And that's what we're going to do today. So. Strap in, everyone. It's going to be a long ride it, uh, with a slow start to begin with as well. So, Zen? Boy, it sure fucking is, isn't it? It is. I think we can both agree that it's a very slow start for this one. <laughs> yes. Until, it, until it, it pops off at a certain point, but we'll, 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 we'll get there. We'll get there. But we'll start with episode 76, which is, In those situations, keep, keep quiet and cook red rice with beans. Go ahead, yes. Zen. Tell us what it's about. Uh, I'm not synopsising this one because almost nothing happens in it. Um, Basically, we find out that Kondo is arranged to be married to the prince of some alien planet that is all gorillas. Princess Bubbles. Named after Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson's monkey. (laughs) And uh, at the same time, uh, Ota is taken by Kube, who wants to make her his wife. Um, We get a little bit of flashback between the two of them, where they are children. And we kind of learn about this promise that Kubei uh, is referencing when he says that it's time to to fulfill their promise to one another. Um, Kondo, meanwhile, meets his gorilla bride after the Shinsengumi try to uh, convince her to, to rescue him, Otai, to rescue him from this gorilla marriage. Yeah, he's saying um, he's hitting 30 and he's starting to lower his standards for women. <laughs> So he might actually just go with it. So he might actually... It turns out he does not like it. He's being forced no. <laughs> into it by Matsudaira. Um, he draws a line. Yeah, Hijikata goes to try to uh, convince him to... to or to convince Otai to help him. And the rest of the Shinsengumi goes. And that's when Kyubei shows up. Uh, he knocks out some of the Shinsengumi like, grunts. All, all of them but Hijikata, basically. Yeah, all of them except for Hijikata who blocks it. Um, and then that makes Hijikata kind of get like a uh, a little angry, and they want to like get even. So when Kube takes Otai, um, Shinpachi, and Kondo are the first ones to go to try to um, like challenge it, and they want to like get her back from this mansion of weird fucking people. That yeah, uh, Kibe belongs to clan. called the Yagyu clan, which is just like a bunch of fucking guys. <laughs> they're like yeah. they're like dojo swordsmen. They're not like quote unquote real swordsmen. Yeah, uh, they, like try, they try and say that. The, yeah, not, they try and say like, hey, they're really good. But to be fair, of the their four aces don't really leave much to be. <laughs> they don't well, do a ton. Yeah, um, which is probably one of the issues that I had with this arc, especially early on. But we'll. We'll, we'll get, get there, there to, uh, when we get there. Um, yeah, yeah this... so they, they leave because they don't want Otai to go because as Otai is leaving, um, they can see that she's crying. Um, Gintoki originally wants nothing to do with it, but then he feels like he can't leave Otai when he saw her upset like that. Um, I actually liked his little line that he, where he says he saw something that he shouldn't have because it stops him from ignoring it when he saw how upset she was. Um and so they, Shimpachi and Kondo break in first, and they go to challenge these Yagyu people, uh, and they get outnumbered and surrounded. But then they get rescued at the last minute by Kagura, uh, Gintoki, Hijikata, and um, 
Okita. Okita, who all show up at the end. Kichikata and Okita want to get even for the Shinsengumi people getting beat on and also want to help Kondo. Kondo and Shimpachi want to rescue Otai, and then Kagura and Gintoki are there to back up Shimpachi. And they get into a little bit more of the actual things on the next one, but that's how it, that's how it stops for this one, so we'll we'll talk about this one. I think both me and you have the same issue of this arc starts really slow. Really slow. Like, it almost didn't really feel... it. It's weird because most of the time... I feel like not a lot of animes have an A plot and a B plot. They usually have one plot and they kind of stick through it. This one's actually structured where there's an A plot and there's a B plot in that something's going down with Tay, and then there's also Kondo and his gorilla thing, and it doesn't really meet up until close to the middle of the episode when um, they just so happen to be working for the construction crew on where Bubbles is meeting up, which also just so happens to be the place where... Um, sh- um, Tay and um, QB are Kube. He- yeah, QB yeah. are hanging out in. So it's kind of like a a mishmash of just like, it's it's funny because when their two plot points actually meet up, there's a real moment of like Kentucky's like, oh no, there's something actually serious going on here, and then a gorilla attacks them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually really liked the uh the bit where he sees how upset she is and he gets up to try to stop her from leaving. And then he is stopped from doing that by the gorilla. And he's just just like, ah, fucking gorilla's still here. Fucking forgot about this stupid gorilla. There's also a lot of like hit or miss things here with, I always like Kondo. And to be fair, I think some of the Kondo stuff can get a little bit weird. I think as the time goes on, it definitely in the specific arc, it gets better. But at the beginning here, (laughs) there's a real close up shot of him shitting himself. Mm-hmm. And him dropping a lot of sh- there's just a lot of shit in this episode. <laughs> there, yes, uh, there's a whole gag where uh, the shit that he shit himself with earlier falls out of his pants. Yeah, and uh, they Perfectly. see it. Yeah, and um, there, there's like a whole long joke where they're like, "You just shit on the floor," and he's like, "Nuh uh," and that's like it's it goes on for arguably too long. It goes on for too long, and he blames. He starts blaming his the the princess, which is really funny when you take into account that the princess is actually just a fully functioning person and is not just a brain dead gorilla. Like she has, her, she she's shown to like understand certain things. There's just like a language barrier between them. Yeah, like she can't speak English, but yeah, otherwise she, she's like a sentient being. Like, yeah, a- aware being. Yeah, and they're treating her so terribly in this episode. Because after he says, like, oh, that's my pet uh, gorilla, and then they start treating her like shit, immediately feeding her f- feeding her random food and just, like, mistreating her throughout the entire time. And then he himself ends up um, punching her into the river, um, which ends up being something that they talk about, I think, even at the end, near the end of this episode, where it's like, she actually really liked all that. She thought he was very aggressive, and she was <laughs> she was down for it, basically, after that. And this does not get brought up again until at the end of the arc. But it ends up being a lot of stuff where I feel like it would have been... I don't know, because actually, funny enough, now that I think about it, some of the stuff that is brought up in here does get brought up later in the episode in which they kind of do the uh, the Death Note shit uh, mind games. <laughs> this couple that's that the first gonna... time I thought the arc was good. Um... That That's when I feel like there was a definite shift. But that's also when I noticed that a lot of the stuff that was in there was literally foreshadowed throughout these other episodes. I just don't know if they could have maybe sped it up just a little bit to get there and still kept all that stuff in there. Because I did appreciate the level of detail that that went into that and the amount of buildup and just like, oh yeah, offhandedly to saying like, oh yeah, I ate this for this morning. We've been really poor. We're going to be eating a lot of these specific like red bean stuff starting from here. I believe in this episode is when they start talking about like, oh yeah, this... um weird bread thing that they got for cheap and on wholesale we're gonna start eating it here but on it ends up being a very slow kind of start to it and i ended up feeling a little bit like i don't really know where it's going from here but i'm willing to see where it ends up just specifically because i remember like by the end of the arc it definitely will have improved but as a starting episode it can be very just like a little shaky that's how i felt yeah, like going it's, into it. shaky it's real slow real slow mm. um in the beginning 
This one especially, I was kind of just like, I, I got nothing for me on this one. I got nothing. Yeah, um, I felt bad for you because I was like, oh, that really doesn't like the shit humor. <laughs> it's not, so. I don't have any like, like inherently against it, but it has to be done really well. Yes. Um, because yeah. like the, the we we've, we've all shat ourselves and are in the toilet and can't wipe our ass <laughs> jokes was like funny. That was really good. That's, um, that's good. This this bit of it, not so much. Um, no. I wasn't really feeling this bit, so no, it wasn't. You know. Bad. It is what it is. Yeah, it's it's a it's a slow start to it, but it does kind of build up for some of the later stuff that I end up liking. I also did kind of like the beginning here with uh, when Hasegawa, not Hasegawa, the fucking H names. Oh, Hijikata. Hijikata. There you go. They always throw me off for some reason, even though they're two completely different characters. Um, I did like seeing him kind of like immediately. It's funny because later on, I think in the next episode, they call him kind of the Vegeta and he does kind of s- have yeah, a Vegeta-esque like, role at the beginning. Well, they say, what does he say? Uh, look how stereotypical he is. He thinks he's Vegeta. <laughs> yeah, he, look at him acting all Vegeta-like is like, uh, because like, he, at some point he says, let me make it clear. I'm not on your side. And then Okita just walks by and say, isn't he stereotypical? He thinks he's Vegeta. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, I'm not on your side. We just have the same enemy. And then, yeah, Okita makes fun of him and calls him a stereotype. Yeah, look at this fucking guy here. Um, but he kind of serves a similar to kind of show up that uh, QB is someone who is strong at the very least when they completely just wreck every single person of the Shishingumi in one, in one, like, one strike. And I can't remember if it's this episode or the next one. I think it's this one where he's, like, repairing the sword and... Uh, Okita brings up the fact that if he had not used the the end of this, like the safe end of the it's sword, then ev- yeah, yeah, every single one of them would have been dead in that one strike. So kind of establishing that they are someone who is extremely strong at the very least. Um, and some other things I did end up actually kind of like, because there were some things. I did like it when they were kind of talking about, ta- which is funny because uh, Kagura starts talking about, <laughs> I feel like every time Kagura talks about her mom, it reveals that maybe her mom and dad did not have the greatest of marriage, but by the end of it, she ended up being okay with it. Because she ends up saying that uh, her mom told her that you can only smile at the start of a marriage. Sometimes you become a nasty hag, but at the end of it, you if you can still smile, then you've lived a good life. And uh-huh. then she kind of wonders, like, can she die? Will Big Sis die smiling? That's her one regret is that she's saying, I don't think she's going to be very happy in whatever situation she's going to be in. And I feel like in that one moment, it kind of does remind her of, like, well, from what she does mention of her mom, whenever she brings her up specifically, it's always in something, like, I guess, kind of life-shattering or in some ways trying to instill something. She doesn't do it all the time. So I guess in this point, she's trying to be, like, trying to understand, like, I don't think she was going to be happy in this situation at all, and we have to kind of go help her. Just from that one moment there, because it's it's actually kind of, they actually bring it up a little bit later, but I did notice it, is that Tay actually smiles a lot throughout, just like in anything that she does, she just smiles constantly. And this is actually the start where she doesn't actually smile very often here at the beginning, so I thought it was interesting. I like that kind of stuff. And again, the episode is a little bit, slow that's the only problem here is that it's a too slow of a starter for me with some other stuff in there but yeah do you have anything else specific to say nope all right <laughs> it it sure happened i have something to say though because it's focused on we have a new op and a new ed for the new op oh, yeah, I, we do. yeah we do. i ended up thinking the op was pretty nice i need to probably get into it a little bit more but i thought it was a very you know, kind of like a happy-go-lucky start of one. That's also a little bit, I guess, sad in some cases. Very, like, sunsets and stuff like that. Uh, still need to get used to the song and stuff, but I always like it when a new OP shows up. But this ED, we need to talk about it. <laughs> this ED. Hey, everyone's just shirtless in the ED? Not everyone. Only shirtless dudes. <laughs> Only shirtless dudes. Well, it's shirtless dudes, and this is when I actually realized that QB was a woman because plot twist that comes out yeah. later that QB is not a man, and yeah. it's because in this ending, uh, they're so they're shown shirtless, but they have like a chest wrap. Yes, like an anime only... cover your boobies wrap. Yes, and they only do that for characters who are specifically swords women who mm-hmm. have to cover up their boobies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um. I actually ended up knowing that a little bit early because in the most recent uh, Jumputi event, there was a whole thing about gender change. And I think in that one, 
she ends up changing into a man, even though I think they look exactly the same to me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the joke is that when they when they gender flip, um, Kubei uh, doesn't change because yeah, she's already like a, a girl who acts like a guy. So like mm-hmm. she becomes a man, but otherwise looks identical to how she normally is. Yeah, something interesting for sure that we'll get to. I don't know what arc that is, but we will get to that arc eventually. But this ED was really funny to me because it is making fun of, I think, the specific ED of the ones that have a lot of beautiful men. And they, th- th- this series knows that a lot of their men are very pretty. But yeah, in this ED. Good looking guys. Good looking bunch tell. of dudes. Good looking bunch of dudes. But in this ED, they have every character. So Prince Hada shows up, which is. Yes. Oh my god, I I think it's, I still have not recovered from talking about the previous episode of Prince Hada, so every time he shows up, I still laugh a little bit from seeing his face. But Prince Hada's in there, Hasegawa's in there, and like his like, uh, divorce look, every single character's in there. At one point they show the dudes from the Just Away dolls. Yeah, the guy, the, the random guy from the Just Away dolls episode shows up. Yeah, everyone! In the ED knows- as a shirtless guy. So it's really funny because this ED is like half like super serious. The 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 tennis wielding Shisengumi shows up. I think he's right after Okita. Mm-hmm. So I like this ED. I think it was really funny with the joke being like, we're just gonna do one of these, but it's every single male, and it's not gonna be all only the ones you want. It's gonna be all of them. So good on them. It was a good joke. Also, Elizabeth's there just to kind of look at katsura for a bit in the background just yeah it's funny have... when katsura just like shows up like he's like looking at the sea yeah. with his shirt off <laughs> and elizabeth watches with him really good i also really like katsura's bit in the op as well um mm-hmm. where he's like standing there and his like eyes covered in black energy and he's like screaming <laughs> and then the sheen changes and he's just captain katsura <laughs> with the eye patch on yeah that that was over good the too. Eye. it's fucking funny that was really good. But yeah, I felt like needing to talk about that because uh, this ED I thought was really good. It might be, at, with the exclusion of the one for the Benny Zakura one, it might actually be my favorite one of the ones they've shown so far just because I like the gag so much. It's such a simple mm-hmm. gag. It is, it is funny. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go on to the next episode. Uh, also, the reason, if you're wondering why the title is called Cook Red Rice with Beans, apparently that's something, in, I don't know, maybe it's a Japanese thing, something the Japanese do, where if your sister's out with a man, all you do is cook red rice with beans and just kind of stay quiet during the entire time. I didn't fully understand the bit, but that at least, uh, I don't know. If... Googling it, red rice with beans symbolizes happiness and prosperity. So you would cook red rice with beans, I suppose, to like wish the couple luck. Oh, that would make sense. Okay. So that's why he's saying, like, hey, if this is happening, just (laughs) cook some red rice and beans and deal with it, my man. I don't know what else to tell you. All right, next episode. Episode 77, Yesterday's Enemies, after all said and done, is still the enemy. (laughs) Uh, So in this one, we have the showdown beginning proper. We get, like, the rules. They're going to have a... For like a what is it a five v five with the, I guess it's six. It's six, it six on six v six, six. Yes, six v six. Yeah. Um. With the Yagyu elites, uh, to try to get Otai back, and they're gonna all have to put a plate somewhere on their body, and if the plate is broken, uh, they're out, and if you break the plate of the team captain, uh, the entire team loses. So the captain of the Yagyu team, we don't know yet because they have not revealed him. The captain of our team is Shimpachi because they're all there posing as students of his dojo for like a... It's basically their excuse to come here is that like, oh, you disrespected the rules of like Bushido culture by not coming to me to ask for my pupil's hand in marriage first or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. and so they all pose as students of that dojo in order to justify being there. Um, and then we start after a little beginning scrape where uh, Kagura and Okita get into some shit. Uh, we, where we start the, the battle maybe proper. the nastiest joke Okita's ever said. <laughs> yes, it's it's uh it's not a great joke. 
Um, no, but he immediately gets fucking hauled out for it and destroyed yes, for he it. He gets fucking which, blasted. Which I appreciated, um, at least in some matter, because he was like, I remember when it was, I was like, God damn, that's a little bit intense, even for the yeah. character who's saying it. But, but I do least, like how after he got hit, too, uh, Hichikata was like, you deserve that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, buddy, you, you fucked up. I don't know yeah. what you were thinking on that one. Which I appreciated. Yes. Good. Continue on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the the group splits up because Kagura breaks her plate because for some reason she thinks hiding it under her foot is a good idea because no one will be able to see it when she's walking. Uh, and then yeah. she takes exactly one step and shatters it. <laughs> um, <laughs> she says, a big stab my foot. <laughs> yeah, and then she goes, ow, I stepped on something. My foot, I cut my foot. Um, so Hichikata takes her to get a new plate. Uh, Okita and Gintoki just straight up leave. They just walk off. Yeah, um, I think after Hijikata says, like, we should team up, and he's like, hey, the, the dudes who left have left. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, they're already gone. Um, and then Shimpachi is off with Kondo. Um, Hijikata is trying to find a plate for Kagura and Kagura's being like an annoying brat about it. And she's like, no, I only want this giant fucking ornate plate. I don't want the other tiny plates. Yeah. I don't want your mayonnaise plate. And I don't want the soy sauce plate. Yeah. And so he has, he tries to go get the giant plate. Uh, and then we see like the fire signal, which is the, the signal to start the game. So she takes both of the plates and makes like a bra out of them. And yep. she's like, All right, I guess I have to use your shitty plates. Um, Later. Yeah, and then she gets attacked, and she gets tossed around by a couple of the people, but she gets saved at the last minute by Okita, and then uh, Hijikata breaks out with the giant ornate plate taped to his chest like a breastplate. <laughs> says it's a, what, I think they ask, what is that? And he says, it's a handicap. Yeah, they're like, what are you doing with this giant plate? And he calls it a handicap, because uh, it's an easier target to hit than the small little plates are. Uh, Kagura gets very mad when Okita reveals that he left Gintoki by himself because, to quote her, Gintoki gets really lonely. <laughs> you leave him alone. <laughs> um, and then it turns out that Kagura is getting beaten by the the person that she's up against, and Okita doesn't understand, and she says she doesn't feel well, which I guess might also be foreshadowing the fact that the food they ate wasn't very good. Yes, yeah, so another um, foreshadowing that the the red bean, whatever it's called, yes. like, were not uh, good. And he he like uh, breaks her wrist, and then Okita's like, "Oh well, I'll just fix it by breaking it in the other direction." And the, even uh, the enemy dude is like, "I don't think you should do that." <laughs> yeah, you should not do that. Uh, don't he do does. That. Yeah, and she gets mad at him, so she kicks him in the shin and shatters his shin. <laughs> just uh, instantly and, like, breaks it. Yeah, just completely breaks his leg. Um, and so they both run away while the big guy is chasing them. Uh, they develop this plan where Kagura will be the legs and Okita will be the arms. And so he gets up on her back. And they go to attack this guy. Uh, because his sword to... gets stuck in the roof. Mm -hmm. um, they end up being too tall and Okita slams his face into the wall, which breaks his plate. Uh, and so then Kagura grabs him by the ankle and uses him as a weapon to break the other person's plate by smashing him into the other person. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that is where the episode ends. Yeah, in a super hyper detailed drawing, she smashes him. Yes. <laughs> Which I thought was great. Um, so some thoughts on this one. I ended up thinking this one was a little bit better than the other one. Uh, some of it had to do with, I actually like the interactions with, uh, Okita and Kagura, even though Okita was, uh, straight up out of pocket with <laughs> the mention of the, the, uh, the, the joke with the egg. Uh, he does immediately get fucking called out on it and destroyed, which is good. 
Um, there's also a bit when they're, like, teaming up to form the ultimate being, which this also comes back at the end of the episode when he does it with Hijikata, which I thought yeah, was Yeah, it's funny. really funny when he does it with Hijikata, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when he's doing it, like, um, she asks him, can you put your crotch away from my head? He's like, I don't really think there's a way for me to do that. Yeah, he was like, I can't help it. It's just that's where it is. It, it just exists there. But then when she's like, I don't, when, he, when the enemy goes, like, I don't think you could dodge me. And then he starts attacking and she, she dodges all the moves, but she makes it so Okita takes all the hits. Yeah, she makes it so that Okita gets hit every time. Yeah, I thought it was really good. And then when he smashes and it destroys them, um, I like the ending of how they take down this dude, where she just, like, fucking grabs Okita and smashes him over the top of him, eliminating him. I also think there's a... I think it is it... Is it yeah, there's another the dude here who's, like, the dick face dude. It's hard for me to really remember the aces. There's four aces in here. Uh, there's well, a the lot big... of them are, like, completely irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, so from here on out, I'm going to call them the big one, the dickhead one, the ketchup one, and then the no-eyes one, which is the, the, one, <laughs> the one in the bathroom battle. He's the only yes. one that's actually competent of the... Th- of yes, the, the dickhead one is actually maybe the funniest one because they keep calling him Dickface and he doesn't <laughs> understand why. Yeah, he's like, "What part of me?" Th- th- then they call him the, the Dick Body. Your entire yeah, he's like, "It's my whole body now. It's getting worse." <laughs> Not explaining anything. Oh, uh, but yeah, when Okita fights him, Okita just straight up fucks him up, which I think is the first time we've seen him actually just go all out on someone. And it's just like this guy is a fucking monster. Yeah, we've never seen Okita like fight fight uh somebody properly because he always has like it's always he's always either in joke fights and like even in this one he's mostly bit. just in a joke fight because he just gets the silly little thing with kagura that that ends with him being eliminated um but yeah he fights the the dick face guy for a second and he's like all right i'll just have to beat the shit out of you with, while avoiding your face because they he makes him say like hey let's not hit each other in the face uh yeah. and then the guy reveals where or no okay Kita finds out where his plate is after he beats the shit out of him the first time. And then he says, okay, I'll have to beat the shit out of you while avoiding both your face and your plate. So I don't have to stop beating the shit out of you. Yeah. And he does. Which was really good. A really good line of like, you guys are here to break plates. I'm here to break bodies. (laughs) Which is what he does. Um, So yeah, I ended up enjoying this one a little bit more. I did like the kind of like the begin. This this arc ends up feeling a little bit. It's kind of like Shimpachi's arc of him trying to kind of understand it, because he tries to give some justification as to why he needs to go get his sister, and he says like if the person that she wanted to end up be with was like an actual dirtbag, like uh, the scum of the earth, someone he just absolutely despised, he would be okay with it if he felt like his sister was actually genuinely down for it. But uh, he could tell, like, obviously, the the whole justification of this is that it's very clear she does not want to be with this person. And that she was uh, extremely sad when she had to leave them. And that's kind of why he's like, it's a little bit like of a thing of like, it doesn't, you can call me a sister complex all you want. But really, at the end of the day, all I really care about is if she's smiling. If this person was able to do that, then this wouldn't be an issue. But they can't. So we have a problem here. So I'm going to get back my sister <laughs> by any means possible. And that's when Gintoki and the uh, Kagura are like, we're not here for her because she doesn't want us to be here for her. We're here for you to help you. And that's it. And if she, this ends up being a big pain in the ass and this actually is someone to be with, it doesn't matter because we were here to help you and not her. So I kind of like that part right there. Um, I can't remember. This is also, I think, when Kondo starts trying to protect him a whole bunch, but... Oh, no, this is the... The egg is also comes up important for the bathroom stuff, so they actually talk about how when they're all eating their food, the 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 ace with no eyes, he says that, um... No eyes. The one who keeps his eyes closed. Oh, right, closed. the eggs aren't fresh. That's right. Yeah. He says the eggs aren't fresh. Something about it is wrong, and so he needs to go get some fresh eggs, and that's the hint there that whatever he's eating is not actually fresh. Which comes up later in more foreshadowing to continue on for the eventual battle that will take him out. Um, and then also the, some a little bit more with the rumbling of Kagura not feeling her best. I really like the bit of Kagura's arm breaking. It was because she really is like I think she would probably just because of who she is she probably would be able to handle them the most out of all of them just because of her crazy fucking strength but they had to find some way of kind of like nerfing her early on so it made sense to me and then she doesn't show up again until the very end of the uh 
at basically the end of the arc by the time things are kind of already set and done. But yeah, I thought it was a little bit better. My main problem is, it's like you've said before, some of these aces are just like not fully cutting it out and it's probably because we just don't have a lot of time to introduce them they're just kind of here and they're ready to get kind of beaten down already so it helped in the previous one when we talk about benny zakura that, that we already had kind of like some of them in other previous arcs so we kind of knew them a little bit more so it made mm-hmm. it so we only had like two dudes who were like comic relief but they still got to do some a little bit stuff here it's a little bit different when you have like four of your big aces and already three of them kind of seem <laughs> like complete goofballs but you know it at the end of the day it is gintama so the way they took this guy down i kind of liked it and i also liked it when she threw a giant rock at him i thought that was pretty good too so yeah the start of the arc how do you feel zen uh this one was a little bit better um i still didn't really like this one this much because I, I was worried that all of the fights were going to be like the Kagura Okita one where it was just going to be like a giant joke and then nothing was going to really come of it. Um, it ended up not being the case and it got a lot better when it stopped being the case. Funnily enough, the biggest joke fight in this one is maybe the best fight. Um, but there is a really good finish also. Yes. Um, but th- that... this one was another one that was just kind of there. Yeah, fun- yeah, funny enough when you bring it up that one is also a joke fight but it's delivered just so amazingly. <laughs> That you just kind of got to go like, okay, justified, <laughs> good, good enough for me. Uh, and now let's move on to the next episode, which is episode 78, which is... Oh, also, they I think they made... I forget if they made a mention here, just to kind of explain the title of this one. I think Shimpaji says, my entire group is filled with people who hate each other, who can't stand uh, that each Gintoki. other. That they was Gintoki. That was Gintoki. said that. They were like... Um... I forget what they what made him say this. And he was like, yeah, us students of it, uh, we don't know anything about each other. In fact, we don't want to know anything about each other because we <laughs> hate each other. <laughs> we actively hate each other. I think it's when the ace, uh, the blind ace, told him, like, uh, you think your country style stu- um, students stand a chance against us or something like that. I think it's during that specific part. Yeah, because they're like, oh, they're like the big city uh elite swordsman and we're like the country boy trained in the streets swordsman yeah exactly yeah so next episode episode 78 people who are picky about food are also picky about people too rolls right off the tongue this is the hijikata battle episode it's pretty much all that happens in this episode uh which felt a little bit weird because it was very hyper focused on a character who is not that important to the overall plot of the, the arc um, yeah, it ends up being that just to give a little bit more. I think it's because people really like Hijikata, so probably. Yeah, he's very this, popular. Yes. Um, so let's it give is him a, a little fight. bit. Of uh, it, it's a good, like, kind of generic but fine fight. Um, it is a the only le- backstory. It's the only cool. legitimate fight of the uh, up until uh, we get no, the end is. Of, of of the ace of the aces. I'll say of, of the, the aces. aces. Yeah, it's the only one that's an actual fight of the aces. Yeah. Mm. Um. And it's Ketchup Man versus Mayo Man. Um, the ultimate battle. Yes. They they have, like, a meal together in the beginning um, where they both, like, they, they're resolved by covering their food in an absurd amount of condiments. Um, there's a really good bit in this in the beginning when Kondo finds Okita, and he's, like, uh, astonished that Okita could possibly <laughs> lose, and he doesn't understand. And they're, like picking apart the results of it like a crime scene yeah. they're like oh his leg is completely broken they must have knocked each other out at the same time and all this shit and then there's just a cell phone on the floor and shinpachi picks it up and the first thing he sees is a picture of kagura posing over <laughs> both of their <laughs> defeated bodies i, I thought this uh-huh. bit was really good just because of how like he's taking it so you can actually feel like kondo actually legitimately is kind of heartbroken over what happened to okita because he's like, the monsters, these apps, not only did they break him, like they broke his leg. This was supposed to be a thing with plates. What is? What are these animals doing? Mm-hmm. I swear I will take them down. Like, it's the first time he's actually been legitimately kind of angry. And then you find out this fucking Kagura with her It was Kagura the whole time, yeah. <laughs> the fucking picture she takes when she does, like, the peace sign over their body she posed over them. Oh, uh, and so then Shinpachi good. shatters the phone, and he's like, I have no idea who possibly could have done this to Okita. Quick, let's go avenge him. Let's get away from here. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's pretty good. 
Um, so Hijikata and this guy start fighting, and um, we kind of get like an explanation of the differences between this like quote unquote street sword style and the like highly trained version that this guy uses. That's more like a uh, educated like gentleman's sword style or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like basically Hijikata's sword style is built around like life or death situations out in the streets where he's constantly like under attack that could kill him. Whereas this guy's sword style is built around like Winning almost points. competition swordsmanship. It's like uh like a sp- like treating it more like a sporting event. Mm-hmm. Um which obviously puts Hijikata at a disadvantage because he's not used to that kind of thing. And he tries um, to use it against him too by like saying like he's using his own instincts of trying to protect himself by like saying like if I go here then it makes him more open to an attack that is like not deadly, but will hit him at least because he just like right yeah by because nature. like yeah the, the, his natural impulse is to dodge as if every attack is lethal, but in a competition environment it's not. Um, and so the guy takes advantage of that to, to land a lot of hits on him. Uh, he does a pretty cool thing where he busts through the bridge um, that they're fighting on. And he f- tricks him into thinking that he stole his plate off of him, when in actuality he just had a plate that he took earlier. Um, and then he gives a cool little line about like, "Whoever you are, I'm not gonna let you beat me at deception." I thought that was pretty. That was a good line. Yeah. Okay. Um, they continue fighting for a minute, um, and Hichikata's trying to keep him on the defensive, so he can't really like faint and counter. He's just trying to like keep attacking over and over and they keep having this like long explanation of like which style of swordsmanship is better and whatnot and uh Hijikata manages to like hide his sword from the guy's view by like dunking it in the water uh and he manages to bring it up and break his plate right at the last minute and yeah and during this entire time we also got like a little bit of the backstory um from Kondo where he says how we met him about how he was basically just like a vagrant who was just fighting other like schools of samurai and just trying to beat them until eventually they all ganged up on him and he never complained about it he just was like it doesn't matter to them that they weren't fighting honorably he just like fought until what basically he would have died if it wasn't for Kondo Mm-hmm. And then you see him kind of like doing the training. You see a little bit of what Kondo's training was actually like, I guess, growing up, which was holding like this giant fucking like wooden bar thing. It's funny because it just looks like a club and he's it, a gorilla. Yes, <laughs> that is actually a good <laughs> mention. Just a giant club, which yeah. is funny. And apparently Okita was also there as a kid in this specific environment because you see Okita and he's like, oh, look at him. He's doing so good. And then it reveals that it's actually just the wrappings around of a log and not a log. Because he's like, look at him. He's doing it with a log. He's like, oh, actually, no, it's just the tree bark <laughs> and not the actual log itself. He's just being lazy again uh, and shirking his work. But then the, the, through that, they kind of he kind of says like, uh, Hijikata is kind of a dude who just doesn't like to lose and he will continuously fight until the very end and even though it looks like he's not necessarily training he is like he makes mention of when he ends up uh trying to repay the debt to the kondo uh dojo that he actually had the same blisters that kondo had which kondo got from lifting the giant club over and over again so he Mm -hmm. was actually doing training like on the side and stuff like that so hijikata is someone who doesn't actually like this is all he has literally to him the sword is only thing that kind of keeps him going and stuff like that so it's very different from someone who is a little bit more training to do it just to kind of like in a competition sense kind of learn to do it kind of more for a it's a different mindset than them so i end up thinking that the fight between them was pretty cool they even bring in the fact that of the mayonnaise versus the ketchup because he even brings up the he makes he shit talks his ketchup use where he's like I see the way you put on ketchup. You're very moderate with the way you put on your ketchup. You put it on the specific stuff that you can eat. I'm not a man like that. I put mayonnaise on my desserts. <laughs> I go all in. <laughs> so I, uh, the- I liked it a little bit too where um, he was like, I eat ketchup because I fucking hated tomatoes. <laughs> and so I forced myself to eat ketchup on literally everything until I started liking it. Uh, and Hijikata was like, yeah, I hate mayonnaise too. And uh, Kondo <laughs> and Shinpachi were like, you're lying out of your ass right now. 
<laughs> yeah, he was clearly lying. I also really liked when Chichikov, when he's, uh, when the guy asked him, was like, you're not going to thank me for the meal? And he, I think he says something like, thank you for the disgusting food. <laughs> yeah, he's like, thank you for the shitty meal. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think this one is the one where I was, like, starting to warm up to it a little bit more, and I think a lot of that is the strength of just literally I like Hijikata a whole bunch, and this was really just a way to show off a little bit of Hijikata, uh, especially because he does kind of take, he does have to take the Vegeta role, where he loses in the beginning of this arc, and then he ends up losing near the end of the arc, but for a completely different reason from when it was in the beginning, so... I don't know. I did, it. I guess it's in a way protecting of the character of Hijikata the way he ends up losing uh, later on to um, QB. But yeah, I ended up liking this one a whole bunch, even though I think it's a little bit funny enough because it's not a jokey fight, not really all the way. It's more of a serious kind of just like generic f- fight of the swords. It ends up being the weirdest one out of all of them just because there's not many jokes. It's just a little back and forth between sword two sword dudes. Mm-hmm. So and I liked the little bit too. I mean, it's it was very generic anime, but I liked the little bit where Kondo was like, um, "Don't, don't help him because if we step in and try to protect him, it, it'll mean that I didn't trust him to handle himself." And I was like, "That's generic," but I fall for that kind of shit. Yes, I can see why people like the Shishin Gumi because they are a lot of generic anime plots, but goddamn it, they're good ones. <laughs> so it works out for me yeah it's like it's one of those things it's like yes it's a trope but it's a trope for a reason yeah sometimes i you know sometimes shit just is good it doesn't matter if it keeps happening over and over again i can easily eat a, a thousand burgers and i never complain about like oh the trope of this burger so overused mm-hmm. no yeah I it's just like didn't... it became a trope because of how good it is so i'm yeah. okay with eating my slop Yes, you know? exactly. Some burgers are going to be better than other burgers, but damn it, no, if I don't love every burger I've eaten. <laughs> if that was prepared correctly, anyway. Not any that get me sick. And speaking of getting us sick, this episode, episode 79, which is our next one, four heads are better than one. This is the start where the everything pops off. From this point on, I was sold. <laughs> Tell us what happens then. Yes. This is... So this is the. Uh, I tweeted about it a little bit. This is the uh, Death Note shitter battle. That's um, also how I described it as. Mm-hmm. So it's Gintoki, um, Kondo, and then two people from the enemy team: the elite with the squinty eyes and uh, Yoda Grandpa. I swear to God, I know his name. Binbokusui. Bin. Binbo. Let's call him Binbo. Binbo. Bimbo Kusai, I think. Um, Bimbo Kusai. Yeah. Bimbo Kusai. They are all in the toilet, um, and they do not have toilet paper. And they realize... Well, actually, so uh, only three of them start in the toilet. Um, Kondo, Kentoki, and uh, Bimbo Kusai, the old man. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the squinty-eyed elite guy uh, does not. He shows up, and he's like, oh, we're going to win because I can eliminate you both right now because you're stuck on the fucking toilet. And then he gets diarrhea and has to take a shit <laughs> in the middle of doing that. Um, so they all are in this, in their, like, different stall, and they've come to the realization that because nobody uses this bathroom, there's no toilet paper in it anywhere. It's never been restocked. Um, and so they're, like, having this mental tug of war where they're, like, trying to befriend one another and then also like betray each other and and try to get out of the stall because the first ones who can wipe their asses and get out uh will beat the other ones because they'll still be stuck on the toilet um there's a i can't even really fully explain it because you just have to see it and like it's wonder in its lustrous it is it is literally Um, a mental battle of it, the meeting yes. of the minds of it is a giant and and it's very death note esque in that like every time one of them says something all of the other characters have this mental like why are you doing that what's the goal are you trying to do this are you trying to do that if that's yeah. what you're going to do i'm going to do this and see what happens like kind of yes. things 
It's like, oh yeah, he said, Kentoki says that we should work together to solve this, but it's obvious that he's just trying to create a feeling of camaraderie between us so that we'll let down our guards and make it easier for beat us. And then this entire thing, it's like they're all sitting on the toilet as like, <laughs> and it eventually gets to the point where it's like the universe itself is around them <laughs> as they're sitting on the toilets. <laughs> as they kind of figure it out. And eventually, uh, Bim, uh, it does a lot of back and forth. It does a lot of mind games. It is maybe the most mind games I've seen in a lot of Shonen fights. Yes, it's... I mean, I wasn't kidding when I said that this little conflict here is, like, better than a lot of actual, like, Shonen battles. Um, there's, like, a really good couple bits in it, especially. Um, like, <laughs> The one where Kondo's like, oh my god, I've been working with this amazing mind the whole time. <laughs> and they're on, like, a chessboard on their toilets, and Gintoki's, like, way ahead of everybody else. <laughs> um, and he's like, oh my god, he's, like, five moves ahead of us all. Um, <laughs> yeah, he did. And then if it gets up when he starts saying, like, um... He's acting uh, Sundere, like it's a visual novel, and then they show a very quick visual novel of what Gintoki would look like in a visual novel. Yes, as like a girl, and he's like playing the part. Yeah, um, he's playing and the he's, part. And he's like, wow, that was executed perfectly because he started off cold and dismissive, and then we all leaned into it. And then now he's being nice, so he's making us look like the bad guys. Um, so good. And then the bit where the old man pulls out the sandpaper and Gintoki's like, oh, now we all... And he, like, asks for it. Mm -hmm. And they're all trying to debate if they should actually wipe with the sandpaper or not. And so uh, the old man and Gintoki fake it, with the old man wiping it on the stall wall and Gintoki is rubbing it on the floor. Yeah. Um, and they're both like, oh, this is great. Thanks. This is so good. Um, yeah. And Kondo has this mental breakdown, picturing the old man like constantly ramming his ass into like burning hot <laughs> sand. And I, I loved it because the crunchy roll that he called him a pervy sage, and then I think yeah, the translator sure note was just like like Naruto. <laughs> um, so and he's then like jumping a bit up with and down. Uh, the other way around, where the guy was imagining Kintoki as like this knight of hot sausage who's used to like burning his <laughs> asshole. <laughs> and he's like dramatically posing in like a cape and a flourish and everything. Yeah, it's um, a, a reference to the count of something. I don't remember what it was. I want, but it was a reference to something. But it was really funny the way they imagined it all. And then, uh, so they have the this like mental struggle where they're trying to find anything they can wipe their ass with, and the elite guy is carrying a picture of Kibe. And Kondo was carrying a picture of Otai. Um, and they're all like, shit, I could wipe my ass with this and get out. It, it is paper, but I, you know, I'd have to wipe my ass with like a picture of the person that I care about the most. Um, and so the guy does eventually do it. Um, yeah, the ace apologizes yeah, his, in his he, mental. He, yes, he wipes his ass with a picture. But Kondo refuses to wipe his ass with the picture of Tai and instead uses the sandpaper. Yep. And they run out and have this showdown that Kondo wins. Um, but then he walks out and is like doing that dramatic sword wound blood spray that anime characters do <laughs> when they get yes. cut with a sword, but it's coming out of his ass because he wiped with the sandpaper. He's like, I'm so and then sorry. And he collapses. Yeah, <laughs> that's the reveal that he didn't use the tape picture. Yeah, that he and, didn't wipe with the tape picture. He wiped with the sandpaper instead. And then a close-up to the tape picture perfectly intact. Yeah, as it falls out of his hand and lays on the floor. Uh. Oh, and that's the end of the episode. The So, man, where to begin with this? It is amazing the amount of foreshadowing that went down to specifically this battle. Because there's also one at the beginning... Which I thought was really funny. So the the big ace here, he, to show the, how protective he is of QB, um, when they're leaving, because QB says, like, I'm going to go fight because it's clear now that they've taken down enough of our aces that there's someone that's actually worth fighting, so I'm going to go fight. 
um as they're leaving a crow goes to a crow goes over QB and like drops a poop and he protects them and he's super protective and saying like no how dare nothing will get past them setting up for the end of the episode where he has to put shit on the face of the picture the stupidest amount of foreshadowing. Yes. It's 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 foreshadowing that shouldn't even matter. Like it, they foreshadowed him shitting on the picture. So it's fucking... so stupid. And not to mention all the fact that he he's sick because of the egg. Every single character that is in that bathroom has a reason. They're just they're not just there because they have a bad stomach. It's due to the events that were set up in the other episodes. Because <laughs> the the even the old man uh, Binko uh, Binko yeah, he say, eats Ty's eggs, which yeah. are like always charred and ruined. Yes, which we didn't talk about, but she's she's been having uh, wife training during this entire time, and she's just basically like cooking her shitty omelets for everyone and the person who's like trading is like i think this girl is too dangerous to be allowed to be in this clan because i'll be surpassed because she even tries to like scold her and she like stops it with like a chopstick and says like don't you think it's a little bit rude to treat someone this way and she does it all with a smile as well so yeah but every single character in that uh, bathroom has a reason to be in there um wait what was kondo's uh, Kondo's was, he was feeling irritable in general, because in the beginning, remember, he says, like, when he's in feeling a specific way, he ends up, he was having stomach trouble from the beginning with the, with the gorilla, uh, princess. So that just continued on. Oh, okay. it's just the fact that he shit himself earlier. He's just continually he's having shit his problems, shitty yeah. stomach. Yeah. Yeah, he just has, like, the worst stomach of any man imaginable. <laughs> That's the reason why he, it fits perfectly for being there. Uh, there's also a bit where, <laughs> which is really funny to me at least, when Binboki, uh, so all three of them are stuck in there, and the guy doesn't know which stall they're in, and then he picks the middle one, and that's where his dude's at, and he comes out and fully naked and says, I'm Bigfoot, do you have any toilet paper? Which is what Gintoki said to him, to, to, to for Kondo to leave, and just kind of go out there, look for toilet paper, and if anyone asks because his ass is so hairy, that just say, I'm Bigfoot, I'm just looking for some toilet paper. So then he ends up doing it, and then when he goes back, he's like, it didn't work. And then Kentucky's like, idiot, of course it wouldn't work. I can't believe you took that seriously. <laughs> but yeah, this uh, episode was fucking amazing. This Death Note battle is legitimately one of the better, one, one of the best battles I've seen of wits, at least. Whereas a friend of my my uh, my uh, uh, friend who uh, has been trying to get me into Gintama, as I told showed him that I was on this episode and I called it it was the craziest battle of wits I've ever seen. He corrected me and said it's a battle of shits. <laughs> oh God, yeah, that's good. Yes, very good. Great stuff. And I think from here on out, the the art kind of pops off for me, and I'm fully into it. I think this was the turning point for me. Where I was uh, down for it. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, this was really good. Um, this is, you know, that meme where you're like the guy's like slumped in his chair playing a video game, and then he sits up. Mm-hmm. Th- this was my sit up episode. <laughs> where like <laughs> before this, I was like, this sucks. This is stupid. Uh, and then this episode happened, and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Damn it! He's starting might to believe see fiction here. After all, <laughs> um, it was so good because, like, it's it's such a well done, like, high stakes thought battle kind of thing. Because, like, that's not new to anime in general. Obviously, no. like, tons of stuff. Does. Death Note being just the obvious example, but there's a bunch of others that do it. Um, but it's actually like well formatted and like really fun <laughs> and to like watch the whole time. Um, I don't know. I was super into it. Like it fucking slapped. Yeah, it was it did. so good. I we might have to talk this into consideration for probably one of the better episodes of Shonen Archive that we've had to go through. It just was so like from stop to end. Once it starts, it just kind of like time flowed pie. I was just like, man, I'm just kind of into this. I just kind of need to see where this goes. I need to see where this specific endpoint ends, and then it ends perfectly with the with the basic samurai battle. Like it all leads up to exactly two slashes from the opponent's side, and then funny enough, it does kind of continue on into the next episode just a little bit as right before the 
Bimbo, uh, Bimbo and Gintoki fight themselves, but it's a lead up into everything. But yeah, I think it was super well done, super well handled, led up to it fantastically, and was just overall fucking great. That's the ultimate seal of approval that I can give. When I just don't have shit to say anymore, it was just fucking great. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it's it's just really fucking good. I can't do it justice on like a podcast based environment. Like you have to just go watch it. But it's we might really have to. Funny. You know what? Later later on, we should have we should do a full breakdown of looking it down, just watching it ourselves and <laughs> looking at it and breaking it down for everyone <laughs> as we actually watch it. Because there's a lot of things to it. I suggest anyone. Go out and watch this clip. Even if you're someone who's not watching a lot of Gintama, I would suggest actually watching it because it's a fantastic battle of, of wits. It's super entertaining for out at all as well. So, let's move on to the next episode, shall we, Zen? Absolutely. Episode 80. When someone who wears glasses takes them off, it looks like something's missing. So, go ahead. Uh, so, we move on to. Closing in on the final battle, Gintoki starts to battle the old man because Gintoki was asked with money, and the old man wipes it with, like, the legendary scroll of his family technique. <laughs> yes, he um, does. Yeah, so they, they start fighting. Um, at the same time, um, Kyube is chasing off after uh, Hijikata and Shimpachi and... Hijikata chooses to stay behind so that Shimpachi can get away because Shimpachi is the team captain. Um, Shimpachi finds Otai and uh, he smacks her because she's like, I didn't ask anyone to come here and get away from me. And so she punches him. And this is actually becomes plot relevant because she punches his glasses off. Um, and then Kyubei shows up after this. Uh, and they start the fight. Him and Kyubei's fight ends up crossing over with Gintoki and um, the old man's. Shortly after, it's revealed by Hijikata that Kyubei is a woman, which he figures out by them fighting, and Gintoki figures it out just because he's like, I know uh, girls when I see them. <laughs> my dick told me, is I think what he yeah, said. Yeah, he, he literally says, my dick told me. And then I think maybe one of my fun, like favorite jokes in all of Gintama is right after that. Where the old man's like, yeah, my crotch sensor doesn't work. I got an erection looking at a slipper and I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> What's so fucking funny? It is Just the, the casual drop of like, I really wanted to kill myself right then was so fucking funny. Oh, and then Kentucky's is very sympathetic, isn't he? He's just like, whether it's a woman or a slipper. Yeah, yeah, he's like he like relates to him. He's like it's okay regardless of what it is. He's like trying to like calm him down. He knows. He's he's like I know you're old. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> but yeah, uh this is where QB reveals kind of like the their entire setup of what they are. Which is, uh, go ahead, try and explain this one. We will try our best to explain this. I think this actual character thing is a little bit tough to talk about in some... Well, actually, I'll let Zen see it well, and see how hard. It's... I think it's yeah. actually very well done. It's just hard for us to specifically talk about it without accidentally, you know, maybe accidentally, like, stepping in Speaking over... from a place of, of feeling we, we can't relate to, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. But I do think this And, and I'm a little bit was... worried, too, because, um... I don't know, because I don't know that much about Gintama, but I, I've seen some stuff that makes me worry that they kind of don't do a very good job handling it with this character in the future. Yeah, um, so we, we won't that this know character kind of kind of devolves, because I think it's handled really well here. Mm -hmm. um, basically, she was born a woman, raised a man, because her clan only permits men to have power. Um, her father does not want her to lose her position, so he chooses to raise her as a boy and just not tell anyone. Um, only the grandpa that's fighting Gintoki and the father know. And then Otai eventually knows as well. Um, yeah, she's known since she was basically a kid. Since they were little. Yeah, when they were children. And that, it, a... it's kind of funny because in the very first episode, Otai makes a, a joke about like, B 
being the balls between your legs. Yeah. Um, and then he kind of asks her to do that in a way that's meant to be like, will you marry me? But then it's it comes around to like, she doesn't have any, but she wants them because she that's how the way that she was raised to be. Yeah. Um, and there's also a really funny kid joke there where he says like, silly, you won't grow any balls. And she's like, no, my grandpa told me I will. <laughs> and then yeah, Chazen, he said they grow in. And, they grow um, in. And she's like, you won't get any of those, but you will get a boy. <laughs> A very innocent kid way of going, like, no, something does grow there. I know that much. What? <laughs> yes. Um, I thought that was good. Uh, I thought the battle scene was really good. So they, they do face off. Um, Shimpachi gets smacked away by the old man. Um, but then Gintoki throws his sword after him so that he'll have a sword to keep fighting with. But he also got his glasses back. So they have a cool little fight here because there's this whole thing where she's like, oh, you know, Shimpachi, you're always in the way you know, you're the weak link of your team. This guy's getting his ass kicked to protect you. And then Gintoki kind of gives a speech as well, where he's like, you know, she's talking a lot of shit, but she doesn't realize that she's just as protected. Like, she's also lived her whole life being protected by you all from the difficulties of life that she would have had to face. Um, they kind of face off at the end. Um, but it's really kind of a setup. I think it actually ends with yeah. Shinpachi, the reveal that he can now clearly see what he's fighting for, which is to protect the people he yes. loves. Right. So. And then uh, Kondo, Okita, Hijikata, and Kagura come back because the dad uh, violates the rules of the game, and he sicks like the rest of the students on them. Uh, and then the, the eliminated members of the team show up to help fight the students while Gintoki and Shimpachi fight um, Kube and the grandpa. Which will go into the ending of the episode here, but we'll, we'll talk about this one for now. Uh, so yeah, the things that I liked about this one, this one actually goes into a little bit more so the specific feelings that I'm going to give here are from based off of this episode, but then I learn a little bit more about specifically QB's character and it kind of goes on from that. But I did think the reveal was very good here where they make it very clear that yes, there are some complications over the fact that it would be a woman and woman uh, relationship simply because of the era that they live in it would be very difficult but all the people there involved don't necessarily care about it um qb takes it as like you just aren't ready to handle someone like me who is like and she also just shit talks hijikata here a little bit where it's like hijikata lost because he couldn't like fight a woman basically he just couldn't at full strength for whatever reason not fight one and those specific gender norms and what he's expected of a woman are the reason why he loses um and it's holding him back and it, qb also believes that that is what's holding him back from accepting the fact that they want to be together and then also Kintoki and shimpachi have a very good reference here where it's like we don't care about that you're acting like an asshole <laughs> you're acting like a jerk a jerk is a jerk no matter what and we're going to stop you because if you are actually someone who legitimately loved, because they both give him like this spiel about specifically love and how love can, can go overcome over anything, which is true. But then they throw it back saying like that what you're giving us is nothing but horseshit because if you actually truly did love Tay, you would notice that she's fucking miserable and does not actually want to be with you. So don't mm -hmm. try and use this shit on us. Like we're not coming at you for anything else. We're clear here that our friend here is not enjoying this and you're not looking at it for whatever reason. Something is blinding you, so that's why we have a fucking beef here. That is the only reason we have a beef here, so you better fucking get ready because we are going to come after you for this. So I thought that was actually, again, very well handled. This is a 2007 anime, and tw in 2022, some people still struggle for with stuff like this. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. <laughs> How things have either not advanced or advanced as time goes on. So I, I give commendance, do words do on that one. This is not easy to write specifically, especially as we mentioned, I believe the writer of Gintama is a man. So it's some pretty heavy stuff here. Me and Zen even feel in some ways uncomfortable mentioning some of the stuff just because we don't want to specifically overshot, to over <laughs> overstate or say something that would yeah. potentially, you know, be taken the wrong way. But it takes a lot of guts to actually try and, like, think this throughout and think of it well. And I thought they did a fantastic job here. I took it here as the beginning as uh, QB has, I think Tay ends up saying, like, she has the body of a woman, but it's a man. And they continue to call her 
a dude throughout the entirety of this. And then by the next episode, there's a little bit more reveals where it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. But for this one here, I was like, okay, I'm understanding what they're kind of saying and I'm enjoying it. It really helps with the uh, the episode itself, raising the stakes. I like the backstory, showing young Tay helping out this uh, young QB. I also like how QB ends up losing the eye because this is where they reveal how left eye was lost is that they uh qb attacked the lone shark Komanto right when their mother died i think i think it was mm-hmm. no, was it their mother or their father their father dies first right yeah their father dies first and that's what leaves them in debt and basically qb fending them off is what ended up costing the eye so you feel like tay is specifically agreeing to this because she still feels very bad about she was in some case the reason why she lost the eye even though QB has told her like hey drop that I don't care about that anymore it's fine I did it for a reason which was to protect you and I don't really resent you or feel anything negative towards that like it's nothing related to that but and then I'm liking it all I, the, the fights here were also <laughs> really good <laughs> the the fight with Gintoki and uh, Binbo, Bin, Binbo uh, was Bin, really good Binbo Kusai Bimbo Kusai was very well done. They kind of mentioned beforehand that he's kind of like a little Yoda dude, and he does kind of fight mm-hmm. like Yoda. <laughs> yeah, like, like flipping all over the place and stuff. Yeah, but it ends up going off very well. I think it's the... Mm, it's one of the... Uh, I really like it when Gintoki specifically like pushed to some kind of edge, because it actually reminded me, as I was thinking of other shonen stuff... Because, like, it's not like Gintoki actually relies on, like, a special move of some kind. It's literally just, like, tactics. And sword tactics are kind of what get him through. Um, Even though his specific sword does help him in the Benny Zakura stuff and stuff. But he's not, like, outright calling, like, special moves. Or there's not, like, no ace in the hole where Gintoki is, like... It's similar to how, like, Goku has always has the Kamehameha kind of just, like, ready to go or... Uh, Luffy has, like, the Gumu Gumu, anything related to that. He always have that in his backhand. Or Naruto has, like, the Rasengan or the different forms of it. Gintoki doesn't really have that, at least early on. It's kind of just, like, all wits and sword battles. So it ends up feeling mm-hmm. like... Uh, I end up really liking the battles for that specific reason. Because it doesn't really feel like at any point anyone's using any special move. It's, like, literally all, like, skill, basically. So... Uh, really like this episode. Really fantastically done. What do you feel, Zen? Uh, it was really good. Yeah, I really like this episode. I really love the cut um, when Hubei is going to... Or no, is that the next episode? I think that might be the next episode. Yeah, that is the next episode. I really like this one. Ignore my animation praise that's in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like the... Um, the fact that we saw the person that Otai eventually like agrees to go work in his creepy like sh- prostitution ship. Mm-hmm. Um, in like the very first episode, um, yeah. he shows back up in this, so I thought that was a cool little callback. Um, but yeah, it, it was good. It was just a nice little like, Cubey's a hypocrite, not understanding that like she's glorifying herself over everybody else, but really everyone goes to these problems. And I liked Kentucky's little. A bit where he's like, I'm not gonna let you sit there and talk shit about my friend that you know nothing about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I thought that was nice. Yes, and all without actually talking shit about what QB actually is. It's actually attacking the legitimate beefs that they have, which I think is uh, good because it would have been very easy for the time to just attack that pretty easily. Uh, also, I should mention here, because it does get brought up in the next episode, when Kagura and everyone else shows up, and Tay sees everyone fighting for each other, and she finally admits, I want to go home. Uh, it's a very, like, touching scene, and this scene also gets brought up again in the next episode with Kondo. <laughs> That's why I wanted to bring it up, because he references it later on, but uh, for a completely different reason. But I really liked it when she finally let herself admit that she's, she doesn't actually want to be here. She just wants to go home with everyone else, because that's where she's happiest. With these knuckleheads that all came to protect her, that's where she's at her peak happy, basically. But next episode, the final one, episode 81, a woman's best makeup is her smile. Go ahead, Zed. So episode 81, this is the finale battle. Um, Shimpachi overpowers Kyubei by 
catching her off guard and tries to finish it off because he realizes that Kibe is a lot stronger than him. Um, it doesn't work, and Kibe goes to finish him, but Gintoki chucks his sword at her wrist and knocks her sword away. Then the old man does the exact same thing to Shinpachi to knock his sword away. All four of them jump up in the air um, to try to grab the swords. Gintoki gets one, and Kibe gets one. And there's like this another sort of four way mental short battle here where it's like, who's going to go where? Which character is going to do which thing? Are you going to attack my grandfather to break his plate, or will I get to Shimpachi's plate first because we're all right here? But then it's like, ah, it was a trick. I'm actually going after Gintoki because, as the one with the sword, you're the biggest threat. But Gintoki reads that move and dodges it and breaks Kubei's plate. And also grabs uh, Kibe's sword and tosses it to Shinpachi. But the old man grabs him by the head and like power slams him into the ground to break his plate. Um, but then it's revealed that Shinpachi was perfectly in step and that he actually was not a uh, handicap for them as he breaks the final plate. And they admit that um, he, he kind of admits defeat. Uh, they have a little moment where. Gintoki and Otai are kind of talking, and then Otai consoles Kube a little bit um, over like the difficulty of her life. And then we get to the crazy uh, wedding with Kondo and the gorilla, where oh, they're so. desperately trying to get Gintoki, Kagura, and Shinpachi to fuck up the wedding, but they won't. They won't do it. <laughs> they're like, no, I don't. I don't want to do that. Um, I for the only thing they're good at, and they don't do yeah. it. <laughs> And it, I, I really like the line where uh, Okita's like, this isn't something to laugh about, boss. And Gintoki's like, I am not laughing. This is the first time at a wedding I've ever wanted to cry. Um, but then Otai shows up to rescue him, which he, of course, loves. Um, and it's a really cute ending bit. I, I, first of all, I really like the ending of anything Gintama where the tune plays. Mm -hmm. um, as, like, after all the serious stuff, they're like, these characters are back to where they're supposed to be, just kind of doing silly shit, and it's playing the tune, and they're all happy. Mm -hmm. um, and we yeah. always get, like, the shot where, you know, they, like, are doing something, and then it cuts to, like, a pastel colored pencil drawing of them kind of thing. Yes. Um, love I love that shit. That shit. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I really like the end where Cube just kind of is like, I finally got what I wanted out of all of this, and then it ends with a picture of Ty smiling, because it's like, that's what he wanted all along. Was Yes. Uh, Ote to be happy, which I thought was sweet. Yeah, very sweet. It was a very nice, touching way to end this one. And it's funny that they dial back here. I love Kondo throughout the entirety of this marriage when they're trying to break it up. Because they're just like... I, he's. They're also doing my favorite bit, which I've explained plenty of times here. I think it's always funny when a character abuses over in a walkie-talkie. I will never find that shit not funny. And they do it a whole bunch here where they're like, over. And he's like, I'm eating bananas over. He's like, don't tell me. You can just talk to each other over there. You don't have to say over for that specific reason. And he's like, over. And I think they end up going to the bathroom. He's like, I spilled a little over. And then they're talking to each other, still doing the over bit, uh, which is really funny. Uh, when Kondo gets saved by the spear, and he's he repeats what Tay says, which is, I want to go home. <laughs> the tearful cry for there and she fucking does a kick because uh well first of all we we, we dodged it but for some reason in the in princess bubbles uh home world it is customary for the for the husband to fuck the wife in front of everyone for some reason and they were all expecting him they all got like ready for it and then tay breaks it up before anything happens but she breaks it on the on the context of like don't do anything weird in front of my brother i don't know what's going on here but please stop whatever you're doing yeah it, it, they make it like she comes to rescue kondo but she actually just grabs kagura and shinpachi and runs yeah and hijikata says like obviously she loves him like you tell me a woman doesn't act so <laughs> hard to get with for someone that they don't care about but then when she comes in it's very clear like hey I, whatever you're doing here don't appreciate it whatever is going on here i also think it's pretty funny when uh shinpachi returns with his weird tupperware bit where he starts putting bananas in tupperware <laughs> yes well was because they did that before in the yeah. uh, uh... <sighs> In the one for the um, uh, what's, the food? what's uh, that food? Yeah, the dongo, dongo, the dongo episode. Yeah, the dongo like cook off. 
where Shinpachi's like boxing it up to take home, and now he's doing it with the bananas. Yeah. I also like the bit where Kagura is like, they're they're talking to Kondo on the transceiver, and Kagura takes it, and she's like, "I need you to tell me where these bananas are from." <laughs> she's some good ass banana. She's like double fisting bananas, just absolutely enjoying the bananas. Uh, I also like it when um, Matsuda, who was the one who set, set this all up, when he finds out that um, he had someone that he loved, he basically does a 180. He's like, I'm a big believer in love. Thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's so fucking funny when um, when they pull up the bed and they're like, yeah, you have to like fuck the gorilla now because that's their culture. <laughs> And he looks to Matsudaira and he's like, you can't be fucking serious. And he gives him like a slow-mo thumbs up. He's like, and he's I like, believe. Are you fucking kidding me? Kondo <laughs> <laughs> was just like so much like, I don't want to get into it with this gorilla. He does so and then bad. when the gorilla grabs him and throws him up in the air and he's like falling in slow-mo like he's about to die. <laughs> it's the worst experience of his life. Because Bruce's Bubbles, I don't think we mentioned, is fucking huge. It's a giant gorilla. It's not just that it's a regular gorilla. This gorilla is massive by any standards. So it would not have been a very happy time. But thankfully he is saved by the uh, Nagita that is thrown by Tay. So all's well that ends well. Um, Before this stuff, to go back to talk about... uh, I also like it when Hijikata shows up to talk to the Tay. Uh, he shows up as a mummy, which is funny because when he first shows up, all the girls are all over him because Hijikata is like a handsome dude. But then when he shows up as a mummy, they all throw shit at him and go, ah, mummy! Yeah, they're like, oh my god, a wicked spirit is here. He's like, whatever. And then she's like, I'm so sorry that you look like a mummy. He's like, whatever. I wanted to, I went to go fight and now I look like a mummy. It's not your problem. It's my yeah, problem. Yeah, I kind of like the little speech that he gives her where um, she's like, look, um, you're not like some kind of savior. Like you, just because you can't fix the lives of every single person you know doesn't mean that you're like a failure or that you should, you know, you shouldn't be so fragile that your inability to do the impossible like breaks you. Um, and it's nice because like these two don't really have a connection, you know. Like no. Hijikata and Otai are not like characters who do anything. But despite giving that speech of like you can't save everyone, he does kind of like save her in that moment he kind of pulls her out of that funk that she's in yeah and she tells was... her what she needed to hear yeah exactly which was nice um really good interactions there with them um i really like the stuff that ended up happening with uh qb because qb eventually breaks down and is saying because the way they were specifically raised which was to be a man but then growing up she actually really you know, loved everything about Tay, and she wanted to be like Tay. She wanted to be a girl, but she wasn't allowed that. But now she's just really confused. She's like, I don't, I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I don't know what I am. I, I just don't understand. And then Tay is like, she doesn't say, she doesn't give him like a whatever. She just kind of is like, he's just there for them. She's just like, yes, I understand it. You had a very tough time, and this is actually a very real situation, but I am your friend, and I want to see you happy. And I'm just going to be here with you for, at least in this moment right now, which I think is what you need. And yeah, you don't get like a full wrap up on both of that. They just continue to have, chances are, this issue that they have to themselves work with. And it's actually something where I was like, oh yeah, I have no idea where, like to write this specific character, it's very hard. Because it's like, I don't know what, at any given point, you're like stepping on a landmine when you specifically are not a person who has dealt with this. I should say that right here, right now. Especially even me with Zen. Even I, as I'm saying this, feel like I'm stepping near landmines because I just don't know if I could accurately say yeah, what it is. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it, it's hard because, like, I, I don't know. Yeah, we just, we don't have that kind of yeah life experience. We, we just so. don't. It's, it's fair to yeah. say we don't. But I think the... Showing that they are a person who is struggling is something that anyone can relate with. And I can understand perfectly of because of their specific upbringing, they're just confused. And they're just a person who just badly wants a friend. And that's what Tay was to them. And maybe that in that way they thought it was love and maybe it wasn't actually. And maybe that what they actually wanted was a friend. And they're just someone who's just like really fucked up and really confused and just needs someone in general. And Tay is there to be that person. And by the end of it, it does seem like they are on good standings at the very least. So, I like that. 
I love the fight with Shinpachi because Shinpachi has very rarely got to do anything. But for Shinpachi to basically show up and put <laughs> beat the useless allegations was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he, his stocks are finally on the rise. Oh, yeah. Big time. Loved it. Also, he used his special from <laughs> Or Collection. That's funny because I did not know that was a special from Or Collection because yeah, I never I, used him. I used him because uh, you had to use him for the, the raid fights for one of them. And I was uh, actually, I think it's, I think this special is specifically in the, um, the goodbye video that I did for our collection. Cause I actually thought it was a really well done, like look, it was a really good looking, um, animation and seeing an actual, an actual animation. It was really well done here. Like with the, the, the stare at the fucking reveal. It's like, ah, uh, I'm here. And then the old man goes, Oh shit. And then he gets taken out. And it was fucking great. I also loved the fake way that Gintoki does where he's up in the air and he just like does a quick, like fucking, baited you out on that one and yes that out. was the cut of animation that i was talking about that i thought was really good yeah was, was when fun. um when he goes to attack gintoki and gintoki kind of gets that smirk of like I-, I knew that's what he was gonna do and he does that quick flip around and then breaks the plate with the hilt of the sword uh it was so good yeah this is what i'm also specifically talking about when i'm saying like gintoki is not a dude who uses special moves he's a dude that's just really good at sword fighting and this is what they kind of show with it here where he actually is able to bait them out and is able to just like put a stop to it, take both swords and basically put his team in the winning position. Even though he's not the one that delivers the finishing blow, he lets Shinpachi do that because he, he trusts in Shinpachi to do it. This entire sequence up, up in the air was just oh so good. <laughs> it was such a good, cool fight. And it didn't like go on for very long. It lasted as long as it needed to be. So I thought that was great. And, yeah, overall, I really liked it. Oh, there's also a really funny bit at the end um, where it, they do the Genpachi uh, Sensei bit where they say goodbye to Onishiki-kun, who, is, who has been with them for a year and a half, but they're moving from Gintama High to the prestigious of One Piece High School. And then he makes a joke about... <laughs> He says it's because of family reasons and not because the acad- the academic standards are higher at the other school. <laughs> Yes, that was funny. <laughs> That's a really good, like, he promises it's a family thing and not because it's one piece and, and, the, and the other one is us. And the other one is, uh, it's a different, like, standard of uh, whatever. But I thought that was really good. I thought it was a really nice way of just saying goodbye to an editor. But it was an overall, like, a, a quick, like, hey, nudge, nudge. Like, hey, we I, I get it. I get the real reason. But, hey, don't worry about it. Uh, and yeah, and that ending bit where everyone's smiling and they're getting chased by a gorilla and it wraps around to the beginning of the episode, I really liked it. I'm similar to you when they start playing that theme. It also was really nice for them to also do like a full show off the all the episodes in the song of the, I believe it's the OP in this case. I thought that was nice. So, over, that's what I feel about this episode. How do you feel? It was great. It was really great all the way through. Really loved it. Um... It was a cute little ending. Um, I don't know. I just like when these characters, like, obviously they've got stuff going on, but I just really like when they, that, anytime, I, I already said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Go anytime ahead. that, like, a big, like, fuck off moment happens and, like, we get the emotional come down, and then that first time that we get to see these characters just being themselves again and, like, having fun, I'm always like, fuck yeah. Yeah. This is great. This is what I'm here for. I love this shit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Gintama is definitely one that is fantastic for that, especially for the arcs that we've had for, where it's the return to, no- to normalcy, basically. Back to the way things were has been handled extremely well. And yeah, that is the end for the Yagi arc. It ends up being an arc that, um, just to give some... F- thoughts here for as we talk about in general i'll ask zen after i'm done with mine but i'll just give mine it's definitely one that i thought is a very slow start but once the stuff that ends up uh being the top things uh for it like specifically the death note shit battle um from that point on i was just like fully sold on everything uh I don't know if a specific slow pace is also something that kind of gets... It's one of those things where it's like, I don't want to specifically tell anyone to do how to do their job. All I know is that by the end of this, I was fucking gripped. I don't know if that excuses a slow beginning, but I'll just say I thought it was a very slow start. So if anyone who's watching this feels like, man, I don't get it, 
by the end of it, I think you will get it. And I think it ends up being worth it overall. And I uh, really enjoyed uh, the arc by the end of it. So I would consider it good. Funny enough, comparing it to the Benny Zakura arc, which is funny because most people always say Benny Zakura ends up being the the weakest of them all. I would still say I probably enjoyed the overall, like the comedy bits and everything of Benny Zakura a little bit more. But the high points of this one, I liked more than certain high points of the uh, previous arc. So it's one of those things of like... Yeah, I would also say that I, as a whole, um, enjoyed Benny Zakura more than this. Yeah, take it Um, as a whole. I think that one's a much stronger whole. But given the high points of this one, I do really like a lot of the high points. Because again... For me, the character QB is definitely walking a tightrope that is very hard to walk. And the fact that they did it and the fact that they needed to say something about it, I think should be commended in some cases. And it ends up making me really like it a whole bunch at the same time. So, yeah, that's my specific feelings on it. How do you feel, Zen? Uh, about the same. I, I think I I didn't love it because like the beginning part really, really was rough. Um, the Hichikata episode was only like, okay. Uh, I don't think it got really good until the the shit battle, and then it stayed really good. Mm-hmm. But those last two episodes really were uh, incredible. I thought they were both really really good. Um, so I'd say it was a it was a solid thumbs up. Yeah, I think from both of us, we don't give ratings here, but it's both definitely. I think our only rating is peak. <laughs> I think that's mm-hmm. the only thing. Peak we give. fiction, yeah. I would say thumbs up definitely for this one, and I really do think that in some cases you could argue the shit battle is a peak fiction moment. <laughs> Uh, not some cases, every case. There you go. All right. We're both ready to stand on it. <laughs> We're uh-huh. ready to debate this at the end of the year when we talk about our peak moments of the year. But yeah, fantastic. done. Always really good to talk about Morgan Tama and we're, he- yeah, we're done for this arc. So what are we going to be doing in the next, uh, coming up episode? Well, it's going to be pretty obvious. It should be just episodes. I say it should be pretty obvious as I don't know what they are myself fan fucking fantastic job on that one it should be episodes 82 83 84 and 85 there's probably another tiny arc of 84 and 85 and 82 and 83 are probably standalone in some cases but there you go that should be for next week on uh, us talking about gintama man what a hell of a series to talk about that's for sure <laughs> yeah mm. i'll say mm-hmm we never know. Every time I sit down to watch Gintama, I never know what the specifics of when the episode are going to be and what we're going to end up talking about. But it is always a really good time. So fantastic job on that. But anyway, we're at the end of the episode. So I'm going to do my end of the episode. But thank you very much, everyone, for watching. If you made it this far, you can always show support to us by by leaving a like it helps a whole bunch but funny enough i am going to start doing a little clip thing i already kind of started doing it by accident with Yu-Gi-Oh gx and i noticed a lot of people were actually really liking that so i was like you know what i will find a moment from here to clip and put some actual anime stuff i'm always afraid of putting anime stuff because you know um the rights holders for shonen jump animes are notorious to going after people who put up anime <laughs> specifically footage from them so i'm always a little bit wary but hey, if it ends up looking nice, then it ends up looking nice. So I'll probably end up doing something for this one when I figure it out. Uh, if you want to follow f- for more Zenrod content, you can follow Zen over on his YouTube channel. I remember to link the channel at the end of the episodes now. So boom, you can easily follow it there. Where uh, Zen does Shonen and Chill with the Ocean Man. Correct, Zen? Correct. Boom. And you can always follow me as I do various whatever shit that ends up liking at that exact moment at any given point in time by following more of me. But that's the end, everyone. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next one. So say goodbye, Zen. Goodbye, everybody. Peace out, everyone. Bye-bye.